everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I uh, just joined Worth about five weeks ago, so this is my first economy, and I'm honored to be able to hear and speak with you all. Uh, I, we have for you uh, two agriculture experts and AI experts, two professors at the University of Florida, and two guys named Charlie. Uh, our first is Cheng Ying, Charlie Li, uh, who is, uh, what these gentlemen do is quite complex and quite manifold, but in simple terms, he is the expert in gaining uh, data that can help improve agriculture. Uh, Carlos, uh, Charlie Messina has graciously agreed to go by Carlos for this talk, so we know who each person is. And in a nutshell, his area of expertise is in essentially taking various data, sensor data, weather, uh, environment, um, and a lot of measurements of actual plants and how they grow, figuring out how, essentially how to grow better plants. And he'll explain it, of course, better than I, than I can. Um, Carlos is a native of Argentina, but we will not be talking about how to breed better cows for churrasco. Uh, we'll be talking about berries, uh, strawberries, blueberries, and a little bit of corn as well. So I want to start, uh, Carlos, in general terms, Oh, I want to say actually how we started on this. It's a, it's a fun story. I met Charlie Lee uh, when we were working on the current issue, and we did a piece on the, um, the hopeful promise aspect of AI. We looked at five dilemmas the Earth is facing. Uh, so environment, uh, education, healthcare, uh, food security, and that's where Charlie came in. And uh, preview, um, our education expert, uh, Perpetual Baffer, will be here tomorrow. You get to hear her story on this. But I'm going to start first uh, with Carlos, and um, essentially, what, is the, what are some of the challenges that's, that's facing basically our ability to feed ourselves? More than feed ourselves, this is a nexus of feeding ourselves while increasing the environmental sustainability mm -hmm. and improving the health of humans. It's not just a food, and that's kind of the title. Uh, I should have had um, Stephanie, um, Peabody from the Brain Health Initiative, which is uh, hosted here in Sarasota, uh, from Harvard University, with, with whom I, I work closely, uh, because our bodies are aging slower than our brains. Uh, that, that's a big problem. And if I can switch slides. Yeah, please, go uh, ahead. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, uh, impactful to me on this side, uh, how, to, how we can use AI to approach this problem. with Rockefeller Foundation uh, put this report where it says we create about one trillion dollars in value of agricultural products and we create twice as much of problems. One is the problems with the diets and the problems with the environment. So this is the nexus that really we need to uh, approach this and one way to do it is we need to increase the availability of foods, the access and the adoption. Uh, I work in Broccoli, one of the things uh, trying to make a kid eat broccoli, right? One particular, the old ones. <laughs> can, can, you breed taste, can you breed tasty broccoli that tastes like cotton candy? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> so we can increase production, but uh, to get the health benefits, you need to eat it. Uh, and at the University of Florida, we have like 30 crops, and we are world leaders on this, so that was a very good environment to start thinking how we increase this availability about five times. We, we eat about one, uh, we need to eat five vex to see impacts of these healthy diets on morbidity and improved health. Is it ability to produce more, to produce it more economically, to make it more nutritious? Produce more with less water. You saw Californians have issues with water. That mm -hmm. was 90% of broccoli is grown. We are going to get that additional production. Where is it going to come from? And you had some success in the past with corn or, or maize. Uh, yeah, uh, with that, drought tolerant. Don't yeah, I will, I will back to this one perhaps if I can. <laughs> but <laughs> no, yes. but I mean, you had said that when we spoke, you were working with DuPont at the time. Right. And I think you increased yield, was it 10%? It was a 5%. 5%. 5% in, in a record time. And uh, it was a challenge that the president of research put forward to the team. I was a young scientist at the time, so we, there were leaders uh, that used prediction, uh, a form of AI. In the past, we call it prediction. Now you can put these mixed models as an AI mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, so we front load the pipeline. And five years later, record time for breeding, uh, the Aquamax brand from Corteva today, uh, it, go, it goes in the market. 
And today, there are more than 10 million acres that is producing more corn with less water. So to me, that's uh, inspiration. Say, well, yeah. how we go from the big seed company to produce all these smaller breeding uh, companies or uh, programs at universities mm -hmm. to deliver on the same but with less. And that's where I think AI is coming to, to, to the rescue, essentially. So this is a very simple cartoon, right? We cross uh, with plants. We can do multiple parents, so uh, we don't have issues. We create an offspring. Uh, since the beginning of agriculture, we select the best plant and hope for the best thinking the genetics, quantitative genetics came along, we have a theory to do it, but it's selecting what we have. AEI brings the opportunity to, instead of selecting what we have, is designing what we want. And increasing these breeding programs in silico by orders of magnitude, and that's what this F, since the AI mathematical model, we do the forensic uh, markers, as you see on TV, and we predict, and then we test what we want to test, what we think is better. So this is a transformation. AI is transforming how we do breeding. And so, that is the hope to increase food production and quality. So you know the characteristics of the plant, and you know what genes cause those characteristics. Right. And then you can virtually yes. breed them. So what's like the, you know, we know how long it takes to normally breed plants, right? What's, like, what's the order of like, speed up and productivity you could do? Uh, the, rate, times? the rate in, in, in corn was 3% a year, and yeah. we always wonder whether it's because that was a corporate uh, goal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we see in the past, achieving yeah. these goals. Uh, but I think, in, let, let me go to this uh, Taylor Sawyer's, uh, again, Floridian uh, PhD student, uh, is measuring photosynthesis, essentially the carbon uh, simulation to produce the sugars that then goes into uh, phytochemicals. Right. So. And, I mean, the, the, the ability to produce sugar, right, right is, a, is a key thing. It's a key thing. Berries, that, that's right? the entry point. <laughs> and then, so I, we were talking earlier, I think you were comparing berries to soybeans. You said that was like the, like yeah. the, the holy grail of sugar production. Right. And uh, in Illinois, they are trying to increase photosynthesis in, in soybeans. And we found mm -hmm. that we can increase 25% in strawberries. Uh, oh. But she went to these machines that you see there. That's a very slow. Uh, we, put together a card with Daniel Lee at the University of Florida. You can monitor the fruits, the flowers. We can use this information to create predictive models. Uh, but it's slow. It's, it's taking this. It's, it's tedious and slow. If you really want to increase this or capture this 25% uh, production potential in a short time, that's where I will pass the baton to my friend and colleague, who is the engineer who builds all these robots. So, we can apply this at scale and deploy it for all the Florida crops uh, at University of Florida. And so you spent quite a few time on corn. How long have you been working on strawberries? How long have you been working on strawberries for? Uh, about two years now. Okay, great. All right. And uh, we should say that these gentlemen don't co collaborate directly on a project, but they do complement each other in the work that they do. So uh, Carlos needs data, and Charlie finds the data. So Charlie, tell us a little bit about sort of what your what you're looking for. Okay. Thank you, Carlos, for setting the stage. Um, so I'm a faculty member. Uh, I teach and uh, conduct research on agriculture automation to help agriculture food production more efficient. Um, so you all know we live in a fourth revolution of agriculture in human history. And as Carlos just mentioned, that uh, AI could transform agriculture food production system. And uh, we use AI and automation uh, to do those things. For example, precision breeding and phenomics, as my colleague just mentioned, and precision agriculture technologies to help farmers optimize their resources to, for example, water and fertilizers to minimize their use and protect the environment and crop disease detection um, and, and, and robotic farming. So my lab is developing um, agriculture robots. For example, this is the one robot we call Mars uh, because it has um, uh, reconfigurable modules, software and hardware modules that can perform different farming tasks such as uh, scouting, phenotyping, weeding, and uh, uh, harvesting of specialty crops. So th because those modules can be reused, the total cost would be much lower 
than using multiple single-purpose robots. So in one example, uh, my group leveraged Mars X equipped with multiple cameras to estimate the yield of blueberries. Um, as you can see, we trained a deep learning neural network model to detect number of uh, berries. And uh, this information can be used uh, by blueberry um, uh, breeders to identify the gene that control the yield, find the genotype that give us the best yield. And, and we, were, we were discussing mm -hmm. how you would, before you would have to do this manually, right? You yeah, have to actually exactly. go out and count berries or flowers you, yeah, on the plants? Exactly. Uh, so uh, before we do this, I mean, plant breeders have to go to the field to visually observe those uh, um, traits, like number of berries, the yield, and the flower number, stuff like that. It's a very tedious process. It's uh, impossible to observe thousands of uh, breeding plots. So this technology um, can make it uh, autonomous using GPS and uh, visual guidance and uh, deep learning to measure, detect those uh, fruit automatically. Here is another example. Um, my group actually leveraged our Mars robot as well as uh, computer vision approaches to um, detect and count the number of uh, cotton flowers because uh, flower pattern, flowering time is a very important uh, trait that uh, plant breeders try to determine that marks the transition from uh, vegetative growth to uh, reproductive growth, which ultimately influence the final yield. But measuring those traits is very challenging. As you can imagine, tens of thousands of flowers over a period of time of two months. You have to measure that every other day. And those flowers are spatially dispersed um, from bottom to top. And often, they are occluded by foliage. So my group modified a uh, computer vision approach called multi-object uh, multi tracking uh, approach to detect and track each individual flower. And, um, and we also collected uh, depth images using stereo camera to uh, map those flowers in 3D and um, resolve those uh, duplicated counting from multiple viewing cameras. So we also leveraged uh, um, like a 3D imaging sensor, uh, such as LIDAR, light detection and ranging sensor, uh, to characterize the architecture of uh, plants, in this case, uh, blueberry uh, plants. And what are some aspects of architecture, when you say architecture yeah. of plants? The yeah, architecture of plants, including the height and width of uh, canopy, as well as uh, the volume of the foliage, as well as the shape of the canopy. And this trait is very important um, because, for example, in mechanical harvesting, one type of shape of uh, blueberry uh, crops is uh, preferred. It's a V-shape, because this V-shape will uh, align with the mechanical harvester design to minimize the ground loss. And uh, certain shapes are also important for light interception and photosynthesis efficiency, as my colleague just mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Open it up to get more light exactly. to the berries. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, previously, um, plant breeders have to evaluate the canopy shape by visual observation or give a score from one to five, uh, which is subjective. But using this uh, 3D point cloud data, we can characterize plant architecture and uh, uh, in a very easy way in the lab, so we don't have to be in the field to measure those traits. Um, here's another example. I mentioned uh, mechanical harvesting of blueberries, right, uh, for a particular shape. And uh, I, I want to back up on one thing. Sure. Why do we need mechanical harvesting? Yeah. So because uh, right now most uh, fresh market blueberries in the mm -hmm. U.S. are harvested by hand, by human workers, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, uh, time-consuming and a costly process, and the efficiency is very low, right? So mechanical harvesting can increase the efficiency as well as reduce the cost from maybe 70, 70 cents per pound to maybe 10 cents per pound for the cost of blueberries that will benefit our consumers. Yeah. And I think you were saying that um, there aren't, it's hard to find people who actually are able to do it given the time frame and the exactly. pay. And exactly. Mm -hmm. Blueberries mature in the, in the period of one month to up to two months. It's difficult to find all those laborers to harvest. Mm -hmm. So we need to advance mechanical harvesting. But the mechanical harvesting technologies at this point will also lead to internal fruit bruising because of mechanical impact. And the fruit bruising will reduce the quality of fruit and the market value. 
as consumers, we try to avoid buying those soft and mushy food from the supermarket. So growers, uh, it is estimated that 10% of uh, total economic losses are due to this internal bruising. So it's a, it's a huge economic loss. So growers want to understand the mechanical damage, internal bruising. And right now, the method is to slice the fruit in half and observe the internal uh, discolored area, which is a subjective and time-consuming process. So my group tried to develop a method using an AI-based web app so growers can use their smartphone and um, after a few clicks, they can get all this uh, um, you know, internal bruising evaluation mm -hmm. quickly in seconds instead of hours. Um, so this web app is very nice to provide an efficient tool to evaluate internal bruising, but it is also a destructive method. It requires slicing the fruit in half. So my group also investigated a non-destructive approach using hyperspectral imaging approach. So as you can see from this image on the left, this is a near-infrared hyperspectral image at 1,200 nanometer. So we found that uh, berries, bruised berries at this wavelength can, um, you know, can be best highlighted for this bruised area because bruised, bruised areas appear uh, kind of less intense, hypo-intense, and uh, non-bruised areas in this wavelength actually appear hyper-intense or brighter. Using this uh, phenomenon, we uh, trained a machine learning model to classify each pixel of this uh, uh, hyperspectral image and uh, classify bruised air uh, berries, and we achieved 96% accuracy. Hmm. Yeah, so this method could have the potential to be incorporated in the packing line to reduce uh, uh, bruised fruit. I know you have one more thing. Let's do it quick because we want to get some okay. questions from the audience. Yeah, sure. So um, this is the last example. So we, we, we also ask ourselves, can we reduce internal bruising mechanical damage in the first place? To understand that, we developed a, a bird sensor, which is a miniature sensor that in, encases a triaxial accelerometer and other electronics in silicon rubber, which has a similar size and uh, texture property as a real blueberry. And so we, we place the sensor in the field and the packing line to record all the mechanical impacts experienced by a real fruit. And then we can improve the machine design to reduce internal bruising. So it's a robot blueberry being picked by a robot harvester. It's a kind of. There like, you go. All right, this is, this is the future of AI. Um, we just need robot people to eat them. So uh, we, uh, are there any questions? I can keep asking them questions, no problem. But if anybody wants to join in, is there anything we could help you with? Okay, we've got a mic runner. She, uh, he, they're going to come over. There we go. <laughs> so, we're looking at industrialized um, agriculture, right? In this process, um, I, I come from Colombia. I'm originally from mm -hmm. Colombia. We, you know, most of our economy is based on agriculture, and it's very manual. I mean, mm -hmm. Colombian coffee is harvested yeah. by hand uh, in most in most cases, and there are small growers that actually use a very complex cable system to get them down to places that actually you know, collect the grain and are able to sell them. Um, can you talk a little bit about getting uh, AI and other pieces of technology in the ag space into the hands of small growers in developing nations? And if there's a, an opportunity for a cost uh, differential that's being brought to by uh, having AI technologies uh, be, part of the, be part of the equation. Yeah, Carlos, you touched on that in your introduction. Can you tell us more about that? Because you've been doing work in the field in those type of environments. Yeah, the, there are uh, two or three uh, in, um, lines. One is the Gates Foundation is working, it has a whole division which is dedicated to deploy these technologies, including micro uh, loans to, to farmers. So in Africa, there's a lot of activity. They're really concerned on the timing of irrigation, uh, precipitation for planting, because that was the biggest risk. Uh, so that's uh, the kind of the sensor and monitoring. In South America, the CGR system, SIAT in Colombia, uh, they have an initiative on uh, AI or digital agriculture with a number of tools that they seek the same purpose. Uh, the, I would say that the most transformational uh, <laughs> Um, effort I, I know in the U is in the U.S. because the, there's a, a startup company uh, who is matching markets and 
farmers and they sort out the problem of traceability. And that connectivity, which is obviously driven by AI and forecasting where the grain is going to come from with whatever properties to match a customer, that is where I think when you solve that problem of uh, traceability and the database, uh, management and the logistics, that's where everybody can access that uh, capacity and with the apps like Charlie Show, you have your quality of the coffee or the blueberries and then you match it whether it's going to processing or to the fresh market. So uh, I think in that case, AI yeah, is, is, is increasing equity, I would say, because once we solve this problem for maize and build the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, then it's very straightforward to extend it to any other product. So I think uh, that's uh, uh, something I'd be really excited about, the uh, AI in sort of balancing and bringing, make it agriculture more equitable. Do we have another? Professor Lee, great work. Uh, so you've got the robot there. You're collecting hyperspectral data and all this bruising data hyperspectral in the lab. What about taking hyperspectral or multispectral to the field to look at watering, fertilizing use, or to look for weeds and invasive species? Yeah, I think uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging has a great potential. Uh, in this example I just presented, we use it for post-harvest food quality evaluation. Um, but uh, we can also use it for remote sensing to put it on the drone to evaluate uh, uh, crop growth status, you know, nitrogen status, stuff like that, as you mentioned. But I think uh, we also need to make a technological advancement to um, perhaps just customize the uh, hyperspectral imaging into multispectral imaging, just to select a few important wavelength bands so we can uh, increase the throughput of data collection as well as data processing. But uh, yeah, th there's a great potential using these uh, technologies for precision agriculture. Just wondering what uh, parts of your combined research might transcend into uh, controlled environment agriculture. Yeah, controlled agriculture, controlled environment agriculture, I think uh, is very important. Um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, we have invited a speaker from MIT. He talked about uh, uh, controlled ag env environment agriculture could be uh, the solution for uh, to uh, com uh, combating the climate change from agriculture perspective. And in rough terms, what is controlled uh, yeah, environment? Controlled okay. environment agriculture, basically like greenhouses and okay. high tunnels and uh, uh, vertical farming, basically. Mm. You grow plants in totally controlled environment. Uh, you either use uh, maybe natural sunlight or just uh, in a container you know, mm. without any uh, sunlight, just use artificial light. I think there's a great potential there. And actually at the University of Florida, we are also conducting research to automate certain process, you know, using IoT and uh, robotics technologies to automate uh, controlled agriculture, environment agriculture. Great. If I may, the short answer is when you think about the cropping system, whether it's rain fed to fully control, the methodologies that are developed at the University of Florida, they are agnostic. So when you predict the water demand, whether it's inside a container or in the field irrigated in, in California, the, the AI methods uh, are generalizable. Okay. So, All right. So yes, the answer is yes. Well, we're, we're getting close to dinner. We've got a few more things before then, and uh, I think we'll all appreciate more of the uh, food and the bounty on our tables. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.